I find deception intriguing probing. Deception pervades all life, emerging up and down the phylogenetic tree. Could deception characterize life itself? What would be the implications for life? What would that say about life? Here is a definition. Deceptions are conditions or actions that communicate misinformation and hide the truth. Deceptions have a purpose, the well-being, often the survival of the deceiver. But deceptions need not be done on purpose. Deceptions are often mindless and instinctive, but they are ubiquitous and potent. They are everywhere and they affect reproductive fitness and evolution. The better the deception, the greater the number of offspring. So, in the toolkit of evolution, what is the work of deception? What can deception reveal about evolution? How to decipher deception in evolution? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. To examine the role of deception in evolution, I scan the landscape of deceptive expressions and functions. Deception in biology often takes the form of camouflage blending into the environment so that the deceiver cannot be recognized for what it is, whether to escape from predators or to pounce on prey. Deceptions may be static, bodily appearances that are genetically determined, or deceptions may be reactive, responses triggered by danger or opportunity. What are examples? and how might they affect the evolutionary process? I start with the revered figure in evolutionary biology, whose foundational ideas helped create the fields of evolutionary psychology and sociobiology. His biography is titled, aptly, Wildlife, Robert Trivers. Bob, what can you begin to say about deception in the animal world? Why do animals deceive? And the answer to that is, is very simple because if they get away with it, they get a benefit. So you can steal food, for example, but you have to steal food with, usually without the owner seeing that you're doing it. Mm. In turn, the owner is selected to uh, hide food. But when they hide food, and this is well known in some monkeys, they have to look around to make sure nobody's watching them when they hide it so that they get away with the deception. So they have to have a theory of mind of some kind to think that somebody else can think about the seeing them hide it. They have to be conscious of social interactions and the fact that, uh, yes, your mind and my mind interact and what you know about me affects benefits to me when I'm doing th things. Mm. Another thing uh, that deception is well known, so-called extra pair copulations, so in various species, especially birds, they're pair bonded mm -hmm. and often for life and they have both male and female parental investment. Well, if the female likes you, let's say, and you're the next door male, then uh, you may get an opportunity to copulate with her when the other male is gone and you may then get paternity over uh, one or more offspring. Mm -hmm. Now, does he know or not? Well, Likely he does not know. There's a, there's a literature on it. Hmm. Uh, I'll give you a joke that I heard from a friend of mine from Senegal, and there's a Senegalese folk expression. Better an ugly child that resembles you than a good-looking <laughs> child that resembles your neighbor. <laughs> How do you differentiate deception from camouflage because as you said they they have this camouflage which has been selected for well no it's it's typically not behavioral but it's fitting yourself into the background so you're undetected against the background camouflage and so to that degree it's a form of deception because unless you evolve to resemble the background you typically don't uh, resemble the background <laughs> yeah. I was in Panama and I would go out there and I would spot moths and moths are nocturnal. They fly at night. So in the daytime, moths are stationary and they're often highly cryptic or camouflaged. So they look like the tree that they're gonna be uh, sitting on. 
Now, I noticed then one evening that at about a distance of a foot, about a distance at which a bird might spot the moth and realize, hey, that's not a tree, that's a moth, they had a uh, sinister image, I call them. So there would be two eyes and a mouth, and one of them, the legs were out sideways, uh, but colored, so they looked like whiskers. Mm. And the top part of the moth uh, had little dots up here, so it looked like ears. Uh -huh. So it was suddenly you saw, you know, and it looks like a cat or something like that. And if you're a bird or a lizard, and you see a predator like that, that close, you take off running. You don't wait to check and say, hey, maybe it's such and such. Yeah. However, the sinister images are themselves so clever and so evolved, that had to have resulted by logic from situations in which the uh, bird does see that it's not actually a cat, that it really is a moth. Mm. Because it's, yes, it's cat-like, but it lacks whiskers. So that then causes the legs to evolve to be colorful. Mm. So uh, you have a co-evolutionary struggle between deceiver and detector of deception, and that co-evolutionary struggle uh, can lead to very advanced forms of deception. Now, there are, there are camouflage creatures that have no sinister images, of course, but it was a joy to discover this whole category. Now, then I went through the literature and nobody else had pointed it out. And I said, how is, how is this possible? Well, if you look at a collection of moths, they all have their front wings so, and their back wings so, and they're pinned in, in such a way that you can identify the thing taxonomically or whatnot. So you've destroyed the very image that you would need to have mm. to spot it. Oh. So, and if your reaction in nature also is you see a moth and you say, I want that for my collection, and you sweep in with your net, <laughs> you ain't gonna see it. <laughs> so that was my theory or guess as to why hasn't anybody noticed something? Oh. Something Deception among animals is a co-evolutionary arms race between those doing the deceiving and those being deceived. Does deception demand awareness of social interactions, a kind of instinctive theory of mind perceiving what others are thinking? It's a powerful process. Is deception in part how evolution works? Is deception a driving force for evolutionary fitness? If so, deception should be found in diverse environments. For example, land or sea should make no difference. I seek a scientist at the forefront of cephalopod research, a class of camouflage superstars that includes octopuses and squids. Jennifer Mather defends cephalopod advanced intelligence and she calls for their ethical treatment. Octopuses, because they have no sort of physical protection, they actually have to live by their wits. <laughs> and one of the ways they live by their wits is they have this fabulous appearance system. So they have pigment sacs called chromatophores in all their skin. And they have, they're actually elastic sacs so that muscles can pull them out and there's nerves directly to each muscle. What that means is they have very, very tight control, three different colors too. Yeah. So they can change their appearance in milliseconds no and they second. can change it on millimeters. Wow, wow. Okay, square millimeters. Wow. So the result is that specifically when they're out hunting, when they're very vulnerable, they can simply look like the background and they can change so quickly. So they go from on the top of a rock to underneath in the shade and immediately they darken. Mm. They're wonderful to watch. Mm. How, how does that mechanism occur? Has that been traced neuroanatomically? Yes. They are seeing in the sense that they're picking up the appearance of everything around them. Right. And then they're sending the information to very big optic lobes, which are immediately below the eyes. Okay. And there seems to be some control of the patterning in the optic lobes. And then there's three different neural centers in the brain. And then it goes immediately out all the way to this two-dimensional surface of the skin. Right. 
But what's interesting about it is we don't think that they're actually self-monitoring. So they produce this fabulous appearance match to wherever they are, but we think they're not monitoring themselves. Well, certainly at that speed, it, it, it would seem impossible to self-monitor, even if you could. <laughs> well, but interestingly enough, they're colorblind. Oh. And they have color patterns. So what they're doing is they're producing something which is fit for the eyes of vertebrates, specifically fish, so that they won't be seen by them. But they're not self-monitoring because they haven't the receiving potential. But they're able to match their environment. That's it, correct. And so how, how is that happening if they're not able to perceive? They really must be picking up black-white very, very sensitively. Uh -huh. And yet, how they decide which of the chromatophore colors they should put on and off, that's a little bit of a mystery to us. Oh, that's interesting. Because if you can't see them, how can you make them? In terms of understanding deception in its broader sense, uh, camouflage certainly is uh, you know, worthy of, of, of inclusion. Oh yes, but you wouldn't say it was conscious no, in any no. way. It's semi-automatic, I guess you could yeah, say. Yeah, right, right. I mean, it's not like uh, a stick insect, because a stick insect, of course, looks like a stick, not an insect. Right. And so you could call that deception. Right, sure, sure. Uh, on the other hand, the insect doesn't know anything about it, the fact that it's deceiving, and it doesn't change, it just looks like it looks like. Right, right, right. S so the octopus is one step above that. In both cases, it was selected by evolution, but in the insect, it's just that way all the time. That's right. With the octopus, it has been selected to have the capabilities because it has to change. That's right. If it was only perfect for under a rock, then it could never leave under a rock. <laughs> yep. On the other hand, it must be the case that um, they're being selected all the time. Mm -hmm. So if you look at most of the octopus species, they have tens of thousands of eggs. Okay. Oh. And it's true that the young float off in the plankton as paralarvae. And so there's not that many that settle on the bottom. On the other hand, if you figure the evolutionary situation that if we don't have lots and lots of octopuses, so they must get selected out. So as young animals crawling around on the bottom, they get eaten by everything that can eat them. Mm -hmm. And so they must get very, very heavily selected. This competence must have been just absolutely shaped incredibly quickly. First thing they do would be hide. The second thing they would do is conceal themselves with the camouflage. But if a predator comes too close, oh, they're wonderful to see. They puff up like this, spread the arms, put black on down by the face, <laughs> and it's a startle. Yes, it yeah. works just fine. Yeah, I'm I mean, scared the, already. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because this startle in the cuttlefish and in the squid, they do the same kind of thing, but they have fake eye spots. Oh. <laughs> okay, which does the same thing. You know, I'm yeah. really a big animal. You just didn't <laughs> know it. Now, if all that doesn't work, they have a smoke screen. Yeah, that's famous, yeah. So they have ink. And it's not just a smoke screen, it turns out. It clogs the gills of fishes. Oh. Uh -huh. Okay, so it's a chemical that yeah. reacts against them. Yeah. And to some extent, it warns other cephalopods. So they've really got four steps. Mm -hmm. So not being eaten is a complicated thing they work very, very hard at. First you try to hide, you have to come out and hunt, so you camouflage, you look like the background. That doesn't work, so you generate a startled display. If that doesn't work, you just jet off into the landscape and, and you squirt out a smoke screen so that the animal that we hope isn't trying to follow you mm. can't. So it's all about not getting eaten. Not being eaten seems a worthy evolutionary driver. In the toolkit of evolution, deception seems one of the sharpest instruments. The four steps of octopus deception shows the intricacy of the process. In the Deception Olympics, cephalopods are gold medalists. Deception in the animal kingdom forms from behavioral patterns critical for survival. The more effective the camouflage, the more numerous the offspring. Is there anything analogous in the plant kingdom? I ask a plant geneticist who discovered key mechanisms how plants adapt to their environments. The author of What a Plant Knows, Daniel Chamovitz. 
Deception is easily seen in the, in the plant world in flower structure. You know, of the tens or hundreds of thousands of different flower structures, some have evolved to mimic an insect in order to call other insects to, to pollinate it. For example, in Israel, where I live, there's a wild flower. It's a series of small white flowers that in the center, it grows a black one, which looks like a female insect. And then all the males come land on it, try to have sex with this <laughs> flower, at the same time, pick up pollen, yeah. and then go to the next one. Right. So it's a, it's, it's a clear example of mimicry. And so how, how would that have occurred? In evolution, you know, it, there was a randomness yeah. that there was an, uh, a mutation which allowed for a black spot. And that gave that one flower with a black spot an advantage of the ones that didn't. And then over and, eons, and, and it was selected and those for. Group, the ones that had a bigger black spot, and exactly. it started out very small right. and a few, and right. then it, 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 it moved in that direction. Right. What are some other examples? Well, it's not necessarily mimicry, but it's, call it communication. There's communication between uh, plants and animals. So for example, I think it's corn, that when it's attacked by um, aphids, it then gives off a chemical into the air, which wasps recognize and then come and eat the aphids. So mm -hmm. there, there, there's this communication or co-evolution of the plant and the wasp to help the wasp protect the plant. Are there any examples of plants that have done things that kind of repel insects or predators? There's a really beautiful example, and it's sort of scary, uh, of a plant called Cuscuta. Cuscuta is also hops. It's a parasitic plant. And in order to live, it has to find a host to grow onto. Oh. So the first question is, how does it find its host? Mm -hmm. And we know that it finds its host, for example, a tomato plant, because it could smell it. It'll grow to the smell of the plant. Mm. But what was interesting is that, does it grow to any plant or only specific ones? In other words, does it have taste, not its, like preferences? <sighs> and if you would give this cuscuta a choice between tomato and wheat. Mm. It'll always go to a tomato plant. Mm. And if you, actually, if you give it a choice between wheat and nothing, it still won't go to the wheat mm. because the wheat gives off a chemical which repels it. Mm. So again, there's this vast diversity of plant responses. Mm. Um, and each species has its own way of surviving. And if you look at the, uh, the underlying root concept of root? deception, I like that. <laughs> uh, w w w it, it is a survival mechanism. Sure. And so everything, everything is survival related and, and drives a fitness in, in evolution. Yeah, I don't like using the word war, but there's a war going on uh, in nature. Mm. And deception is one of the strategies to survive. Because we see that very evidently in the animal world. How, how important of that is in, the, in the, uh, the fitness selection in the plant? Everything that we see in the animal world in terms of evolutionary pressures, deception, uh, how we survive, of course carries over into the plant world, and maybe even more so. Animals can run away. A plant being rooted has to be able to adapt to survive. And so the evolutionary pressures on a plant are perhaps even stronger than on an animal. And maybe this is what led to the vast diversity of form and structure of higher plants and higher plant flowers. Multicellular plants and multicellular animals evolved in parallel, but why are plants and animals sharing similar senses? Because even these early progenitors of plants and animals had to communicate with their environment and communicate with each other. And so the evolution, the ability to respond to chemical signals, the ability to respond to light was present in the common ancestors of plants and animals in the oceans. And now we see this in all plants and animals today, why we share similar abilities. To find deception rife throughout the plant kingdom is to confirm its central role in the evolution of diverse life. But is deception limited to life as we know it? There are entities emerging on the spectrum of diverse intelligences. As artificial intelligence, AI, advances and accelerates, with processing powers increasing exponentially, could AI become deceptive? If so, then would AI deception extend beyond the realm of what we currently call life? And should we worry? I discuss AI deception with the physicist author of Life 3.0, Being Human in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, 
co-founder of the Future of Life Institute, Max Tegmark. Some people tell me that they're not worried about AI causing harm to them because machines can't have goals. But of course they can. We, today's machines that are pretty dumb, we tend to put goals into them. And you know, if you're being chased by a heat-seeking missile, you're not going to say to yourself, oh, I'm not worried about this because it can't have a goal. It's sure acting like it has a goal, and, and that bothers you. Um, what's even worse, with machines having been given the goal by some deceiver to deceive you or harm you, than a human coming, being told to go and do bad things to you, is that they lack the kind of human inhibitions that evolution has given us with, right? Even the worst dictators in history sometimes faced problems where their troops just refused to carry out that massacre or refused to do certain very deceptive stuff because they felt, nah, I just can't do this. Whereas an AI we built is built with a blank slate and uh, that makes it all the more important to make sure that the goal that we put in are actually goals to help people, not to deceive them or harm them. And it also means that it's reckless if we sell very powerful AI systems to anyone who wants to buy them and let them put in their own goals. Mm. These are so powerful technologies right, that are worse than the worst henchmen you can hire that we need to have some restriction on, <laughs> on their use. What about the possibility of uh, a future AI um, not having built into it uh, goals to deceive, but because of the level of uh, intelligence that's built uh, there, it develops it on its own. Is that possible? If we one day succeed, which most AI researchers are guessing will happen maybe in decades, you know, to build AI that can do everything we humans can do, then of course we have to be open to the possibility that they might evolve have all sorts of other goals that we didn't even give them. And uh, there, I think, the, the solution we have to go for is the same solutions we use as parents, you know. We don't just teach our children how to use power tools and so on and weapons. We, we also try to instill in them goals that we feel are good goals. We also try to make sure that they adopt our values and goals and even retain them, you know, as they get smarter. All of those things we need to figure out for machines too, and it's, it's hard, uh, even at the very nerdy technical level, you know. Uh, anyone who has parents, we, we know the big difference between making our children understand our goals and actually adopting them. <laughs> it's going to be just as hard with machines, especially since our machines today are too dumb to even understand what our goals are, and then uh, to keep them. The problem, though, is that you could be successful with 99.999%, and if that 001% uh, is, re rejects your sense of morality, uh, that has the potential for devastation. It's the same with all powerful technology, from nuclear weapons to synthetic biology, that, that the, you need to switch to, from the strategy of uh, just being sloppy and learning from mistakes to the safety engineering mindset. When we sent people to the moon, we also thought through the 99.99% and decided to add some more nines to that by, by systematically thinking through everything that could go wrong. You know, when you put people on top of explosive fuel <laughs> tanks and <laughs> launch them to a place where no one can help them. That wasn't Luddite scaremongering. You know, that was exactly the safety engineering that ensured the success of that mission. And that's exactly the mindset we need to have as we build ever more powerful AI. When deception describes non-human life, animals or plants, the conditions or actions are predetermined, stylized and repetitive. In the arms race between purveyors of deception and recipients of deception, evolution works its species-making magic. In animals, if they get away with deception, they get a benefit. Hiding food, extra pair copulations, sinister images, four levels of octopus deception. In plants, flower structures mimic insects to attract real insects that disseminate pollen. Clever how evolution figured out such diverse deceptions. While evolution is required to discern life, deception is useful to discern evolution. If super AI could ever become deceptive, then might deception be some kind of competitive universal principle larger than life? 
more systems of information than assemblies of cells? I'm still a skeptic. I think consciousness is essential for true deception, and I do not think AI, even super AI, can ever be conscious. But suppose I'm wrong. Suppose AI could become conscious and could intentionally deceive. Or non-conscious AI could machine learn to maximize deception. Shouldn't we heed Max's warning before it's too late to keep closer to truth? For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.